Welcome to another Fireside Chat brought to you by the 150th Anniversary Committee. I'm Mary Kay Stilwell, and today I'm going to talk about our prime movers and guiding lights, women in the UU Church. For 150 years, women have provided all sorts of services and perform many roles in support of our church, fundraising, religious instruction, caretaking. They've given sermons when there was no preacher and played piano, violin, and harp when there was. They've been social advocates, attending protests, writing letters, testifying before legislative committees for equality and justice throughout our history. We have much to be proud of. When I started out, I was going to offer an overview of women's activities from the First Lady's Aid on through Cakes for the Queen of Heaven. But my subject has morphed into a deeper look into just a few women from the past who can continue to inspire us. As William Faulkner wrote in Requiem for a Nun, the past is never dead. It's not even past. These women who have gone before us offer stories that I believe give us courage for the hard work that we know is ahead. I thought I already knew Mary Monell uh, and who she was until I ran across the newspaper account from July 1876. The headline reads, Lawn Party. One of the happiest affairs it was ever our pleasure to attend was a lawn party given last evening at the residence of J.D. Monell on 18th, the corner of H. We doubt if there are any grounds in the city as suitable for entertainment of this kind than those of Mrs. Monell. And the way they were laid off on this occasion showed excellent management. Ice cream and other refreshments were kept on the north side of the lot. The tables were placed along the side where all kinds of suitable refreshments were served. A plank walk, walk was put down leading around the south side of the house and there a fine platform for dancing, 30 by 50 in size, was erected. The article goes on for a while about the party and its splendor and the fun they had, and then concludes, dancing commenced at a seasonable hour, a portion of Pryor's orchestra finishing the music, furnishing the music. The evening was so pleasant and the scene, scene so beautiful that nearly everyone remained outside and nearly everybody in the city was there. Mrs. Monell is to be congratulated over the brilliant success of her undertaking. Well, that story made Mary Monell human to me, and I wanted to find out what I could about what it was that brought her to Lincoln to live, to dance, to found a church. The city's first newspaper, the Nebraska Commonwealth, founded in 1867, advertised opportunity and wealth to Easterners, hoping to lure them out to the new state. But by then, Frank Welsh was already here. He was an engineer by training and served on the Nebraska Territorial Council. He became registrar in one of the land offices where folks could file for a homestead, and then later became U.S. Senator. Important to our story, is that in 1862, Frank Welsh traveled back east to Massachusetts to marry his longtime love, Elizabeth Butts of Hudson, New York. While he was there, he may well have encouraged his new brother and sister-in-law, Joseph and Mary Monell, to join him and Elizabeth, Mary's sister, out west. By 1868, Lincoln had grown into a city of 500 and Joseph Monell arrived to open a lumber yard to take advantage of the city's continuing growth. Most buildings were wood frame. It was a good career move. Joseph and Mary, along with their teenage daughter, Kate, came to live on H Street, not far from the site of the First Universalist Church that Mary would so tirelessly um, work to build. Liberal religion was firmly planted in Hudson, New York where Mary was born in 1828. Quakers were among the first white settlers of Hudson and the Universalist Society organized a number of churches in the area in the 1840s and 50s. 
Thanks to Mary, our church followed their pattern with an initial organizing group and a church building following a year or two when funds were collected. Following the Panic of 1873, however, the Universalist Society could no longer provide funds for a pastor. Although she was in California visiting her daughter by the time the society could send Reverend uh, Chapin to Lincoln in 1883, Mary must have been elated by the good news. She was never to return to Lincoln, however. She became ill and passed away in San Francisco. As we've learned in 1891, the Unitarians organized in Lincoln. And in 1898, the Universalists and Unitarians joined forces to pay off the church loan. As Mary Seymour has reported in her history of our first hundred years, many were school teachers joined by laborers, clerks, shopkeepers, and a variety of professionals who came together to sign the charter for the new church. Over half the members were women, many of them remarkable for their lives and their works. It's really hard to know who to highlight. One of the women that Seymour tips her hat to is Flora Bullock. Flora and her sister Edna were daughters of settlers, and like the Manels, they were from New York. Flora was an internationally known composer, and examples of her published sheet music can be found at the Nebraska State Historical Society. She provided music for the congregation for many, many years. The hymn that brought her international attention was O Ye Who Rule the Nations, translated into French for the International League of Mothers and Women Teachers for Peace. Flora, an 1897 graduate of the University of Nebraska, was a college friend of Willa Cather. For many years, she taught at the State School of the Blind. I first ran into her poetry and that of her sister Edna in graduate school. Her poems are included in many early anthologies of our, of our state poets. Flora and her sister, and much later, Margaret Reedy and Victor Seymour, the man Margaret would marry, were members of the Palladium Society, the first student organization on campus. Our charter members also include Suzette Bright Eyes LaFleche, daughter of the Omaha chief Iron Eyes. Here's a short introduction to Suzette, produced for the Nebraska sesquicentennial. Let me set that up. Time for another Now You Know in Nebraska. At the end of the 20th century, it was a Nebraskan who was considered the first woman to speak out about the treatment and rights of Native Americans. Suzette Brideye LaFleche Tibbles, a member of the Omaha tribe, began her work by traveling with an editor from the Omaha World Herald to Oklahoma, where the Ponca tribe had been unfairly displaced from Northeast Nebraska. Together, they document the death and disease that had plagued the tribe because of their relocation. Years later, Brideye married the editor that had worked with her on the project. She went on to be at the center of many more fights for Native American rights. Bright Eyes served as a translator in the Standing Bear trial and then traveled the country with him to speak and testify, including before congressional committees, about the lack of fair and honest treatment of Native people. Bright Eyes spent the end of her lifetime writing about the days when her tribe lived free. Thanks again for joining me on Now You Know Nebraska. Suzette, born in 1854, is the younger sister of Susan, uh, who was the first Nebraska native physician. Um, they were both born into the prominent Omaha family that stressed the importance of education for their children. When the reservation school closed, Suzette and later her sister were sent to a boarding school in New Jersey to complete their education. 
After graduation and wrangling with the Indian commissioner, Suzette became the first American Indian teacher on the Omaha reservation. Suzette became interested in politics when she moved to Oklahoma, when she traveled to Oklahoma to visit the Ponca tribe, as the video mentions. Her paternal grandfather was um, Ponca. When a Ponca chief returned to Nebraska in 1878 to bury his son, he was arrested and confined, confined at Fort Omaha. Standing Bear, the chief, challenged the arrest and Suzette acted as a, his interpreter during the trial and testified herself as to the poor conditions on the reservation. Thomas Tibbles was the reporter covering that trial. Standing Bear's case turned out to be a landmark civil rights case, which asserted Linda, which asserted that Indians were indeed persons and as citizens under the US constitution, they had civil rights. Suzette and Thomas were married in 1899, not long after Tibbles became editor of The Independent, a weekly populist newspaper, which brought them to live in Lincoln. Both signed the church charter. Suzette died at the age of 49. In 1994, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Our time together is running out, and I had hoped to include a long profile of Viola Luzo, a white universalist from Detroit who was killed in 1965 by the Ku Klux Klan in Selma, where she'd gone to support the efforts of Martin Luther King Jr. Although she was not a member of our local church, she exemplifies the passion, courage, and activism that inspires all you use, no matter where they live, men and women, to work for change. She left a husband and five children. I urge you to take a look at a film, Home of the Brave, which recounts her life. Viola's daughter, Mary, 17, at the time of her mother's death, is now a social justice activist. She describes her mother's decision to go to Selma like this. My dad said, you don't have to go, it's not your fight. And my mom said, oh, it's everybody's fight. There was no thinking it over for her. When Dr. King came on the television, we watched our fellow citizens being beaten and run over by dogs. To my mother, the real question was, why wasn't everybody going? Mary Minnell, Flora and Edna Bullock, Suzette LaPlesh Tibbles, Margaret Reedy Seymour and Viola Luzo are models of well-lived lives, good works, and lots of courage. They are our prime movers and our guiding lights. They remind us that the sustained effort, generation after generation, helps bend that arc of moral universe to recall Martin Luther King Jr.'s statement and moves us closer to justice and liberty for all of us. Thank you. <laughs>